and with that, I will uh, stop and hand the podium over Dr. Ruth Yi, who is a world leader um, in the world of hepatobiliary cancers, as well as uh, many other aspects of cancer care, and very proud for her to be my partner in crime. So would you all please welcome Dr. Ruth Yi. Thanks, John, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, we, oh, this is always sort of an exciting time for uh, Rouge Center because um, it's our annual symposium and we had to see a lot of uh, old friends and making new friends uh, at the symposium. Um, so this year uh, I'm, I am chairing um, the target uh, therapy session for GI cancer. And so um, we're very excited about uh, the progress has made, been made in precision oncology and target therapy and uh, personalized uh, treatment uh, in patients with GI cancer. So today I've uh, had a very a group of prodigious uh, speakers who is going to provide you an update on uh, uh, progress made in GI malignancies on target therapy. We we'll start with the first uh, speaker. Uh, it's a good friend, um, Dr. Teresa uh, Macarula. And uh, so she received her medical degree from University Autonoma Barcelona in Barcelona, Spain. Afterwards, she completed her specialty training at medical oncology. And she currently is a physician at the medical oncology department at Val del Brown University Hospital in Barcelona, Spain. Um, Dr. Macrula uh, is also the head of the GI cancer program since April, 2017. She's working in a gastrointestinal tumor team. She's involved in translation of research, pharmacodynamic uh, phase one studies with molecular target therapy and related translational research with a special focus on EGFR inhibitors. She is also involved in phase two and three studies with new chemotherapy agent in GI tumors with special interest in hepatobiliary pancreatic tumors. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Macarula is the author of numerous publications, mainly focus on hepatobiliary pancreatic tumors and new drugs. Uh, she has uh, authored communications at different conferences and she actively participated in the development of national and international clinical investigations, especially in relationship to drugs uh, directed against molecular targets, as well as clinical investigations for new chemotherapy agents. So let's, uh, let us welcome Dr. Uh, Magrula, um, her talk from Spain. So thank you very much. Um, uh, Let's see if it's working. I think it's working. So yes, um, thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I would like to, to talk about the target therapies in two uh, different tumors, mainly in biliary tumors. That you will see there's a lot of new approaches and a lot of data. And then pancreatic cancer, that it's more complicated, but we have some advances in the last decade. So first of all, we start with biliary tract cancer. So in the last decade, we learned how we have in the different tumors that constitute the biliary tract cancer, that are the gallbladder, the ampullary, and also cholangiocarcinoma, among them intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, that include perihelial and also distant cholangiocarcinoma. We know that these different tumors presented different etiology. Also, they presented different symptomatology at diagnosis, and more importantly, they presented different molecular profile, as we will see later. However, we treat all those patients with the same treatment. Uh, this is the trial that established our standard treatment for a lot of years. This is the ABCO2 trial that demonstrated or treated patients with biliary tract cancer all together and demonstrated the combination of cisplatin and gemcitabine was superior to the, to the treatment with gemcitabine alone. And take a look of these numbers because then we, we can compare with the numbers that we have now with the new strategies. With this combination, cisplatin and gemcitabine, patients treated with this combination presented a PFS of 8 months and a median overall survival of 11.7 months with a response rate around 25%. So um, remember these numbers. And then today we have 
a new standard treatment, at least in the United States, because this is FDA approved and it's not in Europe because it's not still approved by EMA. The TOPAS trial, it was a randomized phase three trial that include patients with biliary tract cancer, only gallbladder, a cholangiocarcinoma without uh, ampullary cancers. And patients in first line setting were randomized to be treated with durbalumab, cisplatin and gemcitabine or placebo, gemcitabine and cisplatin. We use only eight circles of chemotherapy and then continued with durbalumab until disease progression or placebo until disease progression. The primary aim point of that trial was overall survival and this is a positive trial. So patients treated with durvalumab, gemcitabine and cisplatin live longer than patients treated only with cisplatin and gemcitabine. And this was established as a new standard treatment in the United States. It is true that again, we put together a mix of patients, a very complex heterogeneous group of patients, and probably not all the patients respond equally to immunotherapy. Unfortunately, today we don't have the data in order to know which are the patients that benefit more from this treatment. Let's start with the target therapy. We learn uh, that the different tumors that constitute the biliary tract cancer presented this molecular profile. So intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma mainly presented FGFR2 fusions, IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, BAP1 alterations, and also BRAF b 600 e mutation. However, when you see the cholangiocarcinoma, but with a different location, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the molecular profile is completely different. HER2 mutations uh, are it, uh, uh, 1A uh, alterations, but with no or with very, very, very low frequency of IDH1 mutation or FGFR2 fusions. And then we have the gallbladder. The gallbladder uh, is interesting because presented some uh, AGFR alterations and also some HER2 amplifications, HER3 alterations, P10 or PI3K alterations. So as you can see here, a very, very different molecular picture it depending on the location that we have. And also interestingly, uh, we learned how intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is among all the biliary tract cancer, the tumor with higher incidence of targetable alteration. In fact, I think we can say that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is one of the tumor with higher incidence of targetable alteration among all the tumors, the different tumor types. Here you have in the left side of your screen, you have the prescreening that we did in the FIGHT 202 trial. It was a trial in order to find uh, patients with FGFR2 fusions, cholangiocarcinoma and FGFR2 fusions, uh, uh, because we want to test the pemigatinib and FGFR inhibitor in this population. So we have to test more than 1,000 patients, cholangiocarcinoma patients, in order uh, to find this population. And interestingly, we have here the data that show us how nearly 50% of the patients with cholangiocarcinoma presented any targetable alteration. And this is a high percentage of targetable alterations. Mainly, as I said before, IDH1 uh, mutations, FGFR2 fusions, HER2 uh, amplifications or mutations, BRAF b 600 d mutations, or MSI, for example. And also we have uh, this SCAT classification uh, that it was um, it was published by the Precision Medicine Group of the ESMO uh, uh, of the ESMO uh, group, and uh, this is had classifications aimed to define clinical evidence-based criteria to prioritize molecular alteration to select target therapy, and I think that's really important. So they classified as uh, SCAT one or two alterations that are the ones with higher evidence uh, for using uh, targeted therapy, uh, IDH1 mutations, FGFR uh, and NTRAC fusions. MSI and BRAF b 600 mutations. And thus, uh, these uh, SCAT1 or 2 alterations are the ones with higher evidence, so the ones that we have to prioritize in order to find this match therapy. Our group did the effort to analyze more than 300 patients with biliary tract cancer, a majority of them intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and we found that around 56% of those patients presented an SCAT alteration, mainly IDH1 mutations and FGFR2 fusions. And interestingly, when you see when we analyze the overall survival in those patients with an SCAT alterations treated with match therapy, the overall survival was much longer than those patients without a SCAT alterations with a median overall survival of 22 months compared with 14 months and with a hazard ratio of 0.5. So really, you have to find those patients and treat with much therapy because this has an impact in the overall survival of our patients.
And then also we saw how the PFS is longer when you treat with match therapy those patients with the SCAT 1 or 2 alterations compared with those with the SCAT 3 and 4 alterations with a, with a PFS of 5 months compared with 1.9 months and a hazard ratio of 0.3. So importantly to find these SCAT alterations, but the effort has to be done for those patients with the SCAT 1 or 2 alterations. So let's see the data that we have with the main targetable alterations that we have with biliary tract cancer, mainly in cholangiocarcinoma. Starting with IDH1, we know that when a patient, when a cell presented at an IDH1 or 2 mutation, that cell presented an increase in the oncometabolite D2HG. And with this, we have in that cell an alterated, uh, alterated epigenetic regulation with increased histone and DNA methylation. Also, we have a, a disdifferentiation of the cell, a decrease in the AT, ATM DNA damage repair pathway, and also we have a stimulation of the tumorogenesis. Well, based in the uh, phase one clinical trial uh, that tested the safety of ibocidinib an IDH1 inhibitor, and they included some patients with cholangiocarcinoma and IDH1 mutations, the, we designed this phase three clinical trial that is a clarity trial that include patients with cholangiocarcinoma and IDH1 mutations in second or in third line. We include 187 patients, and those patients were randomized to be treated with ibocidinib or placebo. And as you can see here, crossover was allowed. Why? Because the patient asked for it, and, and, and we think that it was ethical to include this crossover. So for this reason, the primary objective of that trial, it was progression-free survival. So here you can see the results of the trial. This is a positive trial with an impact in PFS and with a hazard ratio of 0.37. That is a huge uh, effort to have this hazard ratio in GI uh, malignancies. As you can see here, we have both curves close, uh, um, but when uh, you see more or less at month two, we have the separation of the curves and then the curves are nicely separated. And interestingly also, you, see, you have here how the PFS at six, at six months or at 12 months, it was zero percent in the placebo arm there was no there were no patients with no progression at that time but when you see the pfs at six months in the ibocidinib arm you see 32 percent of patients without progression at one year 22 percent of the patient without progression so that's an important number of data for this this kind of patients however we do not have impact statistically significant impact in overall survival but that's something that we uh, it was expected because 70% of the patients that were treated with a placebo uh, can do the crossover to ibocidinib. And for this reason, it's very difficult to have an impact in overall survival. However, when we apply this RPST uh, method in order to uh, adjust the results for the crossover, you can see here that the hazard ratio for overall survival become 0.49, so statistically significant, with a median overall survival of 10 months in the experimental arm and 7.5 month, months in the placebo arm. Let's now move to other uh, uh, other uh, target that is FGFR. We know that when we have an alteration in the FGFR genes that can be a mutation, a fusion or amplification, we have a constitutive receptor activation. And with this, we have, of course, a chemo resistant and uh, a tumor uh, a stimulation in the tumor progression and angiogenesis and so on. And then I will focus in uh, FGFR2 fusion. This is especially frequent in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma with a frequency between 10 and 20% of patients. And we have different partners with these FGFR2 fusions, but the most important or common one is the BICC1 uh, partner. Uh, this, the fact that we have different partners, uh, multiple partners, it's something that difficult sometimes it makes more difficult to find these fusions in these patients. So here in this slide, you can see all these FGFR inhibitors that in different uh, uh, clinical trials, mainly phase two clinical trials, they uh, demonstrated a similar activity in patients with cholangiocarcinoma in refractory setting with FGFR2 fusions. You see a lot of drugs. Uh, mainly, uh, I want to highlight that pemigatinib, it was uh, the only one that is approved by FDA and by EMA. It's an FGFR1, 2, and 3 inhibitor. Then we have Futiva. It's also approved by FDA that is irreversible FGFR inhibitor. And then we have infigratinib also approved by FDA. And finally, the relay 
a compound that we will discuss later is also the only one that is selective and irreversible. I will discuss only one of these trials with you because more or less all of them are with the same uh, uh, similar and the results are, are pretty similar. This is the 5202 trial. It's a single arm phase two trial that includes patients with cholangiocarcinoma in refractory setting and they included three different arms. One with FGFR2 fusions, the second one with other FGFR alterations and finally with no FGFR alterations. Primary endpoint overall response rate and patients were treated with pemigatinib uh, two weeks on, one week off until progression. Here you can see there's only activity in those patients with FGFR2 fusions. There's no activity if the patient presented other FGFR alterations or no FGFR alterations. And you can see the response rate of 35.5% that this compares pretty well with this response rate of 25% that we have in first line setting with chemotherapy with cisplatin and gemcitamine. Also, when you see the PFS, 6.9 months, and the median overall survival in this refractory setting of 21 months, you can compare with 11 months in the ABCO2 trial. So really, when you target uh, this target, this um, this alteration, uh, you have a really good and uh, an, an active uh, results. And then I want to highlight, I have to highlight these results because are impressive. This drug uh, uh, that is the Relate 4008 drug, the results were presented, are preliminary and <clears throat> were presented in the ESMO meeting in Paris. You have this trial, uh, they started with a phase one trial that <coughs> try to find the dose of the of the drug. This is completed, but then now we have a phase uh, expansion, phase two trial with different arms. First of all, that is the arm that I will present the data, and it was presented in ESMO meeting, FGFR2 fusion cholangiocarcinoma with FGFR naive patients. Second one, FGFR uh, positive fusion patients, but previously treated with FGFR inhibitor. Then FGFR uh, fusion patients, but treatment naive. And finally, patients with other FGFR alterations. And here you can see the promising preliminary results that they presented. 63% of response rate in those patients with FGFR2 fusions Pre, uh, not previously treated with FGFR inhibitors. And when you see the 17 patients treated with the recommended dose, the overall response rate is 88%. So I think it is absolutely impressive. This is a selective, irreversible FGFR2 inhibitor. In fact, I have some patients in the trial and I treat some patients after FGFR inhibitors and also the response are pretty, pretty good. So we'll, let's see what happened with the rest of the cohorts and let's see what happened with the mature data of this drug. We have uh, nowadays two uh, randomized phase three clinical trials that are testing this strategy of FGFR inhibitors in first line setting. Uh, we have a trial with pemigatinib and we have a trial with futivatinib. The only problem here or the only difficulty that we have is that we have to test for FGFR before to start the trial and before to start the treatment. And sometimes to perform this NGS analysis and diagnosis is not so easy. Sometimes we have to repeat the biopsy or we have to do a liquid biopsy that it's not always successful. So that's a, something that it's difficult to, to, to manage. But then once you find a patient with FGFR2 fusions, patients are randomized to be treated with cisplatin gemcitamine compared with FGFR inhibitors. And the crossover, again, it's allowed to the patients. So the primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Let's now move to the target that I like, I think, the most, that is HER2 overexpression. Why I like this target so much is because it's common in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, but it's more common in extrahepatic and in gallbladder. And those are tumors in which we do not have many treatment options. It's different from the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So for me, this is a great uh, uh, target to, to look at. Uh, we have the data with Sunny Data Map. Sunny Data Map recently published. Uh, it's not put here, but it was. Re it's recently published this this phase one trial. Sunny Data Map is a via via specific antibody that simultaneously binds to two distinct sites on HER2, and in a phase one clinical trial with biliary tract cancer with HER2 amplification, you have this overall response rate of forty one percent. So that's incredible. It's really good data, and uh, and this is published recently. And now we have only also completed the phase two trial. 
trial that included around 100 patients with biliary tract cancer and uh, HER2 amplification with this uh, uh, drug. So we will see the results, but my experience treating patients with this drug is fantastic. I have two patients with gallbladder, so a, pay, a tumor with really bad prognosis, and I treated in second line with this drug with a complete response for more than one year and a half. So that's absolutely uh, a good uh, results for this population with really, really bad prognosis. And then we have published the data with pertuzumab and trastuzumab in those patients, again, with HER2-positive bariatric tract cancer with this response rate of 23%. And also we have the data presented in the last task committee uh, with uh, trastuzumab, the ruxtecan, with this overall response rate of 36% with median duration of response of seven months. So it seems that this is a target that can help us to treat our patients. So it's not easy to do, uh, it's easy to do, so it's not complicated to do. So I think all our biliary tract cancer have to be tested for HER2 overexpression. And another interesting approach is uh, this uh, dabrafenib and trametinib uh, combination, the ROAR trial. It was a basket trial that included different cohorts. One of these cohorts include patients with biliary tract cancer with BRAP B600 in mutation. That is around 5-7% uh, of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And they demonstrated in a very, very refractory population this spectacular response rate. And in fact, I have some patients treated with this strategy uh, with really bad, bad uh, performance status, very, very um, uh, um, high uh, tumor burden and respond really, really well to this strategy. And finally, the fusions. We have, of course, some patients between 2 or 3% of patients with cholangiocarcinoma with this entrac, uh, uh, entrac fusion and lalotrectinib and also entrectinib demonstrated activity in this group of patients in these, uh, 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 in these um, trials that include different tumor types with a fusion. The same strategy with the Libretto trial that was recently published with selpercatinib is a red in, a inhibitor in patients with different tumor types that uh, presented the red fusion. In this case, they included one patient with cholangiocarcinoma and responds pretty well with a partial response to this, to this strategy. So also we have to think in the fusions in this group of patients. So take home message for biliary tract cancer and target therapies. Biliary tract cancer is a really heterogeneous group of tumors. Uh, it is true that cisplatin and gemcitabine plus or not durvalumab, it depends if you live in the United States or in Europe, remains a standard first-line treatment option, and we treat all biliary tract the same way. But then we know that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma presented this high percentage of targetable alterations, being IDH1 mutations, FGFR2 fusions, HER2 amplification, and BRAP B600 mutations, the most promising one. So with this, it's uh, to do to perform an NGS analysis in biliary tract cancer is a must in order to find this much uh, treatments for our patients and, and to improve the overall survival of these patients with really poor prognosis. Now pancreatic, unfortunately, we have less opportunities, less alterations in pancreatic cancer, but we have some some data that is interesting. First of all, we have to say pancreatic cancer is one of the tumors that remains uh, with worse prognosis, with less improvements in overall survival in the last decade. And unfortunately, when you see the numbers of the epidemiology in 2020, the number of new cases are too close of the number of deaths. So here we have a lot of uh, work to do and we have a lot uh, to improve, with no doubt. How we treat pancreatic cancer? In general, 95% of our patients with chemotherapy, we have the napakitaxel or fulfirinox, and we can treat with both, uh, with both strategies. We tend to use more fulfirinox in young fit patients, but, but it's only a clinical biomarker that we have. Uh, we have any other biomarker? Well, we have the retrospective data from the non your tumor program here in the United States, in which show us how to have a DDR alteration it's not, a, it's not a prognostic biomarker, as you can see in the left side of your screen. Patients with uh, live the same, the patients without DDR alteration. However, when you introduce the platinum-based chemotherapy in your treatment, then this becomes a biomarker for platinum-based chemotherapy. So patients with DDR alterations um, has to be treated with platinum-based chemotherapy because it has an impact in overall survival. Here we have one positive biomarker uh, for platinum-based therapy. And also we have the only one, in this case only one, this is not biliary, positive biomarker-driven population in pancreatic cancer, it is the POLO trial. In this trial, we did the effort to, run, to screen three, more than 3,000 patients, and we find that seven 
found that 7.5 patients presented the biomarker, that it was the germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. Only this small percentage of patients, and it depends of the country, this percentage is lower. But also, um, these, these patients have to be treated you know, as an induction uh, treatment with platinum-based chemotherapy, and those patients that uh, didn't progress can be randomized to be treated with loparib or placebo. In this case, I have to mention that nearly 40% of the patients cannot be included in the trial. Why? Because some of them uh, progress on platinum-based chemotherapy. So this is a good biomarker for platinum, but not 100% of patients respond. This is not ovarian cancer. Less patients respond than in ovarian cancer or other tumor types. So again, it's complicated. So uh, in four years, we, uh, we can include 154 patients that were randomized to be treated with olaparib or placebo. And this is a positive trial. It's positive for its primary endpoint that was PFS, that uh, was PFS with a hazard ratio of 0.5. It's also positive for the other efficacy endpoints, for example, response rate. And I think the most beautiful uh, number in this trial is the duration of response. So patient that responds to Alaparib presented a longer duration of response that patients uh, that responds to uh, placebo. And as you can see here, the median time uh, responding is two years. So this is pancreatic cancer, but this small population with this biomarker that is germline BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, if they respond to PARP inhibitor, they can uh, be on treatment for two years. This is the median duration of response. So that's uh, that's a different population of the general pa uh, pancreatic cancer. But we do not have any impact in overall survival. Why? Probably because this trial was no, not powered for it. Uh, also, some patients in the placebo arm were treated with PARP inhibitor at progressions. A majority of patients were treated with uh, platinum-based chemotherapy at progression. So any, uh, anyway, this is a negative trial for overall survival, but is approved by FDA, IMA, and it's, uh, it's a standard treatment for patients, as a maintenance treatment for patients with germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 who have um, metastatic pancreatic cancer and not progress after platinum-based chemotherapy. And we have also another trial, a single arm phase two trial that tests rucaparib with the same strategy. They include 46 patients. Again, patients are treated with platinum-based chemotherapy and those patients with more, no progression are treated with rucaparib. But interestingly, here, the biomarker is a little bit different. We have germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation also PALB2, and they include somatic BRCA mutations. They, see, they have these impressive results, PFS of 13 months, overall survival of 21 months, that is really good for to be pancreatic metastatic setting, respond rate 41%. But interestingly, when you see who responds, we have complete response in patients with German BRCA, but also in patients with uh, PALB2, and we have some nice uh, response in patients with somatic BRCA. So that's important, some patients with a somatic BRCA can uh, respond pretty well to platinum and can respond to some PARP inhibitors, at least with rucaparib. And nowadays we have this clinical trial. I think if it's important to personalize the therapy in this um, palliative setting, that is a metastatic setting in pancreatic cancer, it's more important to personalize the treatment in the adjuvant setting because here we can cure the patients. And this is the Apollo trial that is ongoing. It's a phase two trial, uh, randomized uh, the patients to be treated with olaparib or placebo in those patients with surgically removed pancreatic cancer with BRCA1, BRCA2, or PARB2 mutations. After uh, surgery and perioperative chemotherapy, at least three months, patients are randomized to be treated with laparib and placebo. So we'll see if we can translate the results of the Apollo trial uh, in the advanced setting in this uh, adjuvant setting. So uh, do we have to do this NGS analysis that is a must in biliary tract cancer in pancreatic cancer? Well, here you have the data of, again, with your data of uh, non-your tumor program in which they they show us how 27% of patients with pancreatic cancer can uh, present this uh, uh, action of alterations. And also they demonstrated uh, nicely how when you treat those patients with match therapy, they live longer than when you have patients without target therapies or with alteration, but you cannot treat with match therapy. So to treat those patients with match therapy has an impact in overall survival. 
And we know also, this is our data from Vallebron, that patients with K-Raswell type tumors, that it's this 5-7% of patients with pancreatic cancer, presented higher incidence of targetable alterations. For example, in our uh, data, we have that patients with K-Raswell type tumors presented 21% of germline alterations and 38% of somatic targetable alterations. And also, interestingly, when we analyze in our data patients younger than 50 years old, this K-Raswell type population is higher. It can be uh, uh, around 20% of patients. So again, in this population that are young, in which we want to fight with all our weapons, these patients presented higher incidence of K-Raswell type, so higher incidence of targetable alterations. So we have to do the effort to find these K-Raswell type patients. And when you find the patient with K-Raswell type, go for the NGS analysis. We have the examples, for example, of these uh, red fusions that we see we saw before with uh, with Corangio in the Libretto trial. They include 12 patients with pancreatic cancer uh, tumors with red fusions, all of them K Raswell type, and they demonstrated the response rate of 54%. So it's really nice response and they don't reach the, 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 the duration of response. So it seems really a good strategy. So we have to find those patients. And then the Zenocutumab history, it's very nice to when you find a patient with an NRG1 fusion that are enriched in those patients young and k well type. So in this population, the fusion uh, are there and we treat some patients in this trial with Zenocutumab. You can see here, they presented the data with 12 patients, but again, more than 50, 40% uh, of respond rate and the tolerability is, uh, is, is, is perfect. So it's, it's, it's nice when you see a patient that progress to chemotherapy and you can offer this kind of treatment with good tolerability and with this activity and you can control the tumor. So you can offer the patient a good quality of life. And then finally, we can oh, so sorry we can drag the draggable. So this is the data from adagrasib in pancreatic cancer in patients with KRASG 12C uh, 12 mutation. It's so rare to find this mutation. It's one percent, even less. But we have the data with this small number of patients, 10 patients treated with adagrasib, uh, and you can see this respond rate around 50% of patients respond, but also the disease control rate, it was 100%. And this is pancreatic cancer. So let's see if this targeting KRAS G12C is the first of other uh, uh, inhibitors, and we can uh, have, uh, we can target other KRAS mutations more frequent in pancreatic cancer. So take home, message, take home message for pancreatic cancer, the development of more effective therapies is crucial in pancreatic cancer because, again, it's one of the tumors with worse prognosis today. The POLO trial was the first positive trial with selected population and established Olaparib as a new standard treatment for patients with germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. However, um, the proportion of patients with pancreatic cancer that presented targetable alteration is around 10-15% of patients, but these are higher in patients with KRAS wild type population, so we have to find these patients. Also, promising results uh, targeting KRAS G12C and hope it it will be the first uh, uh, muta KRAS mutated uh, uh, alteration that we target, uh, we hope. And so completed NGS analysis is a must in advanced pancreatic cancer, at least in those patients with KRAS wild type tumors. And the term in ger germline BRCA, of course, it's a must and it's uh, in, the, in the NCCN guidelines. So we have to do it in all our patients. So with this, thank you for your attention and, and I will be here for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank you. Uh, that that's a very de um, nice discuss uh, nice um, presentation on target therapy in pancreatic biliary cancer. So we're going to save all the questions to the end. And now let let me introduce the next speaker, Dr. Steve Maron, and he he is a medical oncologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center who specialized treating gastrointestinal uh, malignancies with a focus on esophageal and stomach cancer. He received his bachelor degree in Cornell University followed by medical degree at the Jefferson Medical College. He completed residency in internal medicine at the Yale New Haven Hospital and hematology oncology fellowship at Uni University of Chicago. He also holds a master's degree in biomedical informatics from University of Chicago. His research, um, he, uh, his research focus on applying informatics tool to identify uh, novel um, therapeutic targets 
and improve patient selection for targeted uh, and targeted therapy and immunotherapy. A, a major focus of this work has been imp improving our understanding of tumor heterogeneity and developing clinic trials aimed to overcoming the, the barrier. Dr. Maron's research has been, so, uh, has been supported by grants from NCI, uh, Conquer Cancer Foundation, American Association of Cancer Research, and many other funding sources. And now let's welcome Dr. Maron, who is delivering the talk from uh, over the uh, Atlantic Ocean in Europe. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm Steve Marin from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and today I'll be talking about evolving targeted therapies in esophageal gastric cancer. These are my disclosures. And so the reason that this is important is when you look at esophageal cancer on the left and gastric cancer on the right, in total esophageal gastric cancer, it actually represents the second highest global cancer mortality. And this is because patients are generally diagnosed in the metastatic setting where treatment options are really quite limited. And so for today's discussion, I'll start by reviewing the role of PD-1 inhibition in this cancer, and then discussing HER2 directed therapy options with several new approvals, then some biomarkers of response to targeted therapies with work at MSK, and then wrap it up with some novel therapies with new targets. And so first I'd like to mention Checkmate 649. So this is the landmark phase three study that evaluated chemotherapy plus nivolumab in the first line setting, leading to the approval of nivolumab due to the improved survival of 13.8 versus 11.6 months uh, across the entire population. But one important point with all of these trials I'm going to talk about today is what it looks like in the unselected versus the selected population. And so when looking at patients who had a pd one CPS score of five or greater, you see a much more pronounced survival, 14.4 versus 11 months. And if you look at the tail of the curve, you have over 20% of patients who are still alive three and a half years out. So it's really a remarkable benefit in a selected population. Now, what is a CPS score? So a CPS score is combining looking at the pd one stating tumor cells plus immune cells divided by the tumor cells in the denominator only multiplied by 100. And this is compared with a TPS score that's less sensitive that's only looking at the proportion of tumor cells that are staining for pdl one And I bring this up because when you're looking at the finer details of Checkmate 649 at the top, you could see for overall survival that the benefit is very clear in those patients with a pdl one CPS of five or greater. But if you look at those patients with a pdl one CPS of less than five, or particularly less than one, there is really no clinical or statistical benefit with the addition of nivolumab in these patients. And so we really have to consider who we give this to in our practice, recognizing the potential for significant toxicity. Now, the patients that do stand to gain significant benefit are primarily those with MSI high tumors representing about five to 7% of the population. You could see MSI high on the left and MSS on the right in Checkmate 649. And you could see that, again, three years out, 60% of patients are still alive with MSI high tumors, just demonstrating what a profound effect adding a bowl map could have. But it's not a complete surprise, as we know even five years ago in this Nature Medicine paper with later line monotherapy PD-1 blockade in red MSI high patients, in blue EDV positive, and in yellow basically the rest. And you can see that despite MSI high being only 5 to 7%, EBV only about 5%, you're seeing that almost every patient in this waterfall plot that had a deep response to monotherapy had either MSI high or EBV positive tumor with very few exceptions. These are the patients who stand to gain the most benefit. There are also the patients who have more distal gastric tumors, not really esophageal or GE junction which is a little bit confusing when you look at our only approval in the locally advanced setting, which is per Checkmate 577. So this is in patients with cancers of the esophagus or the GE junction only, either adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, who had undergone chemo radiotherapy, followed by surgery with residual pathologic disease. And these patients were randomized in a 2 one fashion to nivolumab for 12 months or placebo with a primary endpoint of disease-free survival. And you can see a very profound separation in the dotted lines for patients with squamous cell carcinoma with a disease-free survival median of 29 versus 11 months, 
more modest, but still clinically and statistically significant in adenocarcinoma in the cell lines, median 19.4 versus 11 months. But again, when you look at the details here, the patients who have a PD-L1 CPS score of less than five, hazard ratio 0.89, and the confidence interval crosses one, there's no benefit. When you look at tumor location, it's really the patients with esophageal cancers, primarily those squamous cell cancers that benefited when you look at histology. So the takeaway here is the patients who really benefited on the study are the squamous cell esophageal cancers or the adenocarcinomas with a CPS of greater than five. And so when we look across our current treatment paradigm, I just showed you chemo radiotherapy followed by resection followed by nivolumab. But then we have two other paradigms in gastric and GE junction cancers, namely FLOT4, perioperative FLOT, or adjuvant therapy as typically done in Asia with SOX or KBOX. And for both of these paradigms, we currently have no immune checkpoint blockade approvals. And that includes several populations that I would expect to drive a great amount of benefit as mentioned at the bottom of the slide. But we do have several studies evaluating this currently underway. These are all phase three studies. So you have Matterhorn, about 900 patients randomized to perioperative FLOT, plus Dervalumab or placebo, Keno 585, where patients were randomized to receive a platinum doublet or later FLOT, plus Pembrolizumab or placebo perioperatively, and then Keno 595, where 600 patients were randomized to definitive chemo radiotherapy plus pembrolizumab or placebo without surgery in this instance. And so these trials are all done accruing with data maturing, and hopefully we'll have an answer shortly to help address our donut hole, if you will. But we do have recent data actually from GI ASCO this year. So we know with MSI high patients from post-op data from the MAGIC study with perioperative chemo, and the classic study with adjuvant chemotherapy, the patients with MSI high tumors either do not gain any benefit from the addition of chemotherapy or potentially it could be detrimental. And so the question then is, do we need the chemotherapy in addition to the immunotherapy, particularly for these patients? And so this is a French phase two study in Neonapija where 32 patients with intention tree were given three months of neoadjuvant immune checkpoint blockade with nivolumab and ipilimumab. 29 of the 32 patients went on to receive surgery. And the majority of these patients then received nine months of adjuvant nivolumab. The three patients that didn't undergo surgery, one was actually found to have metastatic disease and two others had declined it. The study had a primary endpoint of pathologic complete response. And remarkably, 59% of patients had a pathologic complete response. So I really view this as a game changer in our field, and this will lead to really subsequent development of neoadjuvant immune checkpoint blockade for MSI high patients. And of things to note here, this is regardless of whether patients were microsatelline stable due to Lynch syndrome versus somatic uh, hypermethylation of the MLH1 promoter. And it was also regardless of pdl one when stratified by five, as you can see on the right. And so when I try to put this in the context of how I, I plan to treat in the future MSI high cancers, I don't have an answer yet for chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery followed by nivolumab. It wasn't actually assessed in, check, in um, Checkmate 577 because frankly, you don't usually see MSI high tumors in this population. I would not do perioperative FLOT. I would not do adjuvant KPOX due to the data that we have from MAGIC and from CLASSIC respectively. But I would love to do more immune checkpoint blockade, particularly on a clinical trial, as we saw in neodopegia. But then the question becomes, if you do have a clinical complete response, is surgery even necessary in some of these patients? If you do undergo surgery and there's a complete response, do these patients necessarily need adjuvant immune checkpoint blockade? And then the last question is, for patients who have a relative contraindication to receiving upfront immune checkpoint blockade, is there a role of stratifying patients by minimal residual disease to see if they need a new checkpoint blockade afterwards? And so to summarize PD-1 therapy, adjuvant nivolumab improves disease-free survival after chemo radiotherapy and surgery, particularly in patients with esophageal squamous cell carcinoma and a pd one score of CPS uh, five or higher. That phase three studies adding PD-1 blockade to definitive CRT and perioperative chemotherapy will hopefully mature quite shortly. And that PD-1 blockade is now moving up to the neoadjuvant setting, particularly for patients with MSI high tumors. 
But outside of the PD-1 direct therapy, we have numerous other approvals now, primarily in the HER2 positive space. And we've actually had approval for trastuzumab for over a decade now, thanks to the TOGA study, which added trastuzumab to a platinum doublet. On the left, an intention to treat population with a modest benefit of a median of 13.8 versus 11.1 months. And on the right, according to our current HER2 positive definition of IHC 3 plus or 2 plus fish positive with median overall survival of 16 versus 11.8 months. So quite a survival benefit. But now we're getting into several very recent approvals. And so this is Keynote 811, which took Capox plus trastuzumab plus pembrolizumab or placebo. And we actually have an FDA approval for the addition of pembrolizumab as it increased the objective response rate from 51.9% to 74%. So it's an overall, it's an objective response rate difference of 22.7%. Now, this has not extended to approvals in Japan or the EU yet because survival data, both for PFS and OS, has not yet matured. But this is certainly practice changing. It's actually based on a phase two trial that was run at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where 37 patients received pembrolizumab, trastuzumab, and chemotherapy. And in this study, we actually achieved a 91% objective response rate with a median progression-free survival of 13 months, median overall survival of 27 months. So really remarkable data. And based on this, if the phase three looks anything like it, I would expect an approval uh, in the EU and Japan as well based on survival. But the other important piece here is that we have very rich correlatives, including serial ctDNA, serial biopsies, and a uh, trastuzumab labeled zirconium PET in many patients pre-treatment. And so the next question became, recognizing that this is an incredibly heterogeneous cancer, both within a disease site and between disease sites in a given patient, can we help identify additional biomarkers of durable response? And so on the left, you're looking at stratification of HER2 IHC, either three plus homogeneously, so across multiple samples if available, or two plus or heterogeneous, that is, did patients have different HER2 scores across sites or within a site pre-treatment? And you can see that these patients that had a homogeneous high expression of HER2 had a far superior progression-free survival of 14.9 versus six months. But you can also ascertain this non-invasively using ctDNA. And this is part of our Lancet Oncology paper on this study where we showed that if you use uh, a ctDNA, uh, MaxVAF adjusted ERB2 amplification, the patients that have the ERB2 amplification have a far superior progression-free survival again. So a non-invasive approach. Another non-invasive approach is using trastuzumab labeled zirconium PETs. And so on the far left, you're looking at pretreatment and you're seeing very intense uptake in basically all of the lymph node sites for this patient. They received induction therapy with one cycle of trastuzumab and pembrolizumab, and you see resolution of all these sites. Now we had our radiologist painstakingly measure every single site that was in this patient. And you could see on the right that nearly every site had a rapid response. And this patient actually remained on therapy for over three years. And so in doing so, we've identified some really great biomarkers that can be integrated into future care. But not every patient was so homogeneous. This is another patient on the study. And you could see that their primary tumor below was very intensely HER2 positive, but had a PDL1 CPS of zero, as opposed to the retroperitoneal lymph node, which was neuroendocrine differentiated, HER2 completely negative with a PDL1 CPS of 100. And once they started trastuzumab and pembrolizumab, the retroperitoneal lymph node was never seen again. But then we went back and we we put together all these different modalities that we looked at. And you could see at the top there, uh, you can see the, the HER2 heterogeneity. Below it, you see the ctDNA parameters. You can see that they had detectable ctDNA with an ERB2 amplification at the beginning, and that this went away completely as their tumor burden declined with therapy, and that they responded in all detectable disease sites at baseline. However, you could see a rise in the ctDNA with now detection of ERB2 amplification once again, but now also a MET amplification. And this was in conjunction with development of new liver lesions and new skin lesions, which we actually proved were MET expressing by IHC. And so this suggests that this patient actually developed more rapid progression due to both HER2 heterogeneity, as well as co-amplification 
of MET, which is a known mechanism of resistance. So we looked back across these patients on this study, and we identified that 50% of patients actually were HER2 negative upon progression. And then of those that were still HER2 positive, we found that cell cycle protein, or cell cycle gene uh, amplifications, ras raf amplifications and mutations, and MET amplifications served as additional mechanisms of resistance in this population. But this actually becomes very important because if you have typically 30%, but in this study, 50% of patients that are HER2 negative after first line therapy, it, it really does help guide what you can use in the second or third line for HER2 directed therapy, whether you're using canonical blockade of HER2, which you'd have resistance with things like MET amplification or EGFR amplification, or non canonical issues like the loss of the HER2. And so this is actually Destiny Gastrico 2, or sorry, excuse me, Destiny Gastrico 1 run in Japan, which used trastuzumab duroxtecan, an antibody drug conjugate. And what I really love about this study, which is in the third line or greater, and using archival HER2 testing, was that they randomized patients who are HER2 positive clinically, two to one, to TDXD versus physician's choice chemo. But they also had these exploratory cohorts for patients who had HER2 low tumors. So IHC2 plus H negative or IHC1 plus. And the primary endpoint was objective response. Now, if you look at the objective response here in the TDXD cohort, it was 51% versus 14.3% with physician's choice. So it was, it was more than threefold higher. This led to an approval in the second line or greater in the US. And as of this week, actually in Europe as well, based on Destiny Gastric Code 2. Now, the exploratory cohorts with IHC 2 plus and 1 plus had objective responses of 36 and 19%. So it's sort of linear according to HER2 expression. Both of these numbers are still actually higher than with physician's choice chemotherapy, albeit with small cohort size. Now, the other interesting point here is that Destiny Gastric 01 did not use uh, repeat biopsies to assess HER2. Destiny Gastric 02 tried to confirm HER2 expression to see if the response rates would go up. Despite doing so, the progression-free survival and the overall survival are almost interchangeable with a median OS of just over a year. And so it's an important point in terms of whether you need retesting or not, that it could be helpful, but it doesn't necessarily make a difference for the studies that we have. So we've talked about PD-1, we've talked about MSI, we've talked about EBV, and we've talked about HER2, but there are numerous other targets under development in esophagogastric cancer, just like the biliary cancers that you just heard about from Dr. Macarula. And so additional RTKs that we can go after include FGFR2, MET, and EGFR. And then we also have many trials looking at quad and 18.2 targeting now as well. And like Dr. Macarula, EGFR is one of my favorites. This is one particular case we treated on SK, a 39-year-old woman, the HER2 positive EGFR amplified metastatic cancer, who uh, received panitumumab plus TAS-102. And you can see pre-treatment extensive lymph node disease, lymphangitic spread, and osseous disease in this patient six months later near complete resolution in all sites. And so I, I recently led a, a consortium of physicians who've been treating patients off-label with EGFR inhibitors around the world. And we published this in JCO. At the top on this swimmer's plot on the left, you can see with concurrent chemotherapy, patients at the bottom are without concurrent chemotherapy. And you could see that many of these patients were on therapy for much longer than six months. Some of these patients on therapy for over two years. On the right, you see a table that is arranged by treatment line overall, and then whether they had concurrent chemotherapy or not. And when you look at each line, whether there's chemotherapy or not, these numbers far exceed what you'd expect in HER2 negative standard of care therapy. And so in a well-selected population, these inhibitors are incredibly beneficial despite negative results from several phase three unselected studies. And so we're currently accruing for a phase two trial of amivantamab, which is an EGFR and MET by specific antibody, and an EGFR and or MET amplified esophagogastric population at centers across the US. But there are other important trials that are currently underway around the world. Several of these are targeting clot in 18.2. And this is based on the phase two FAST trial, which used EOX in combination with Zolbituximab several years ago. And again, this gets back to selected versus unselected patients. 
In this trial, patients had 70% of their tumor cells staining for quad in 18.2, and you can see in the patients where zolbituximab was added, a significant survival benefit. There are two phase three studies now underway with zolbituximab. There's Spotlight combining full fox with zolbituximab and Glow using K-Box with zolbituximab. Just within the past day, there's a press announcement from Spotlight that it achieved its progression-free and overall survival endpoints. And so stay tuned for news from the FDA on this approval and companion diagnostic. But additionally, there's the phase two fight study. And so this combined full fox with bimerituzumab in patients whose tumors express FGFR2B. And this paper was actually just uh, published in Lancet Oncology. And it demonstrates that in these patients with FGFR2B expressing tumors who received the merituzumab, there was a statistically significant survival benefit. As one would expect, the lower you draw that threshold, that is just any expression of FGFR2B, the more modest the benefit will be. They actually stratified patients' tumors by whether they had over 5% or over 10% of their cells expressing FGFR2B. And the higher the percentage, the better the overall survival benefit. And the patients who did the best were actually those that had FGFR2B amplifications, which only represents though on the order about three to 5% of the population with another small fraction that had FGFR2 fusions. So similar to what you just saw in biliary cancers. And so like we saw with the Claudin studies, there are two phase three studies with bimerituzumab that are currently accruing around the world. There's Fortitude 101, which is looking at full FOX plus bimerituzumab or placebo. And there's Fortitude 102, looking at full FOX plus nivolumab plus bimerituzumab or placebo. And again, this is strictly in patients with FGFR2B expressing tumors. And so to summarize, uh, trastuzumab labeled zirconium PETs and CTDNA can both serve as non-invasive biomarkers of durable response to HER2-directed therapy that EGFR and actually meta inhibition seem to be effective in well-selected populations with prospective trials underway. And that frontline phase three trials targeting both Claudin 18.2 and FGFR2B are currently underway with approvals expected shortly. So it's really an exciting time for our patients in esophageal gastric cancer with new approvals for pembrolizumab, nivolumab, trastuzumab, deroxtecan, and soon it looks like for zolbituximab as well. And with that, I'd like to Thank Georgetown for the invitation to speak today, and thank you for listening. Thank you for the very nice um, detailed discussion of, about target therapy immunotherapy in upper GI cancer. So now let's talk. Uh, let's in, uh, introduce our third speaker, uh, Dr. Anthony Tesfaye. Um, he is a friend and a collaborator um, from Washington Hospital Center. Um, so he's board certified medical oncologist and hematologist at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, who specializes in diagnosis and treat, uh, treating patients with GI cancers. Uh, prior to joining to MedStar Washington, Dr. Tesfay served as assistant professor at NCI Desk Nivit Barbara and um, uh, Kamano's uh, Cancer Institute, Wayne State University in Detroit for five years after completing his fellowship training at the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Georgetown University Hospital. Uh, now let's welcome Dr. Tess Faye. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation to, to, to give this presentation. Um, do, I, do I advance this, this slide? So? Yeah, okay. the green button. Um, so I don't have any conflict of interest. We'll be talking about um, um, the proper patient selection in the adjuvant setting using newer tools, which is a CTDNA. And then we'll be talking about a uh, more personalized uh, approach to treatment in the advanced colorectal cancer. Uh, I won't be talking about immunotherapy because I, I assume there is a separate session for that. Um, so why do we need to personalize treatment? Um, there is a very good understanding that no patient is alike from the perspective of their tumor and then from the perspective of their 
clinical presentation, their overall uh, health, and pharmacogenomics as well. No, no patient tolerates the same treatment in the same way. So it's very important uh, to understand this and then personalize our treatment approach accordingly. Um, the patient's tumors, you know, if you look at the um, you look at serial biopsies or serial molecular profiling, you can understand that there is a, an evolution of clones as well. So the treatment that worked at the beginning of their uh, cancer journey may not work you know, at all uh, towards uh, the middle or the later end of the journey. So there is a, a very important need uh, to, to personalize treatment according to the patient's need and also according to the, 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 the patient's uh, a molecular uh, profiling progression in their uh, course of disease. Um, there are a lot of factors to consider when you want to personalize treatment. Obviously, the patient characteristics, for example, age is an important you know, parameter, uh, whether they have uh, uh, significant comorbidities, uh, their functional status, their uh, previous uh, histories of treatment, uh, what, what kind of uh, um, uh, physical activities they perform. For example, a musician who relies on their tactile uh, sensation may not be a suitable candidate for uh, a very intense uh, regimen causing neuropathy. Um, tumor burden is another uh, issue, whether it's a, you know, there is an unanticipated surgical complication from the treatment is an important uh, uh, um, factor in making sure that you, know, you don't offer them anti-VEGF treatment up front prior to their surgical uh, treatment. Uh, tumor laterality is also another thing. Um, it's not where the tumor is located, rather you know, what kind of tumor it is in terms of its molecular composition. We have known for some time that right-sided tumors are more aggressive and um, for different reasons. Uh, it's, you know, uh, it's not just being right and left, but it has uh, to do with their embryologic origins, uh, the, Blood supply is different, the pattern of spread is different, um, but their uh, molecular um, uh, composition of the tumors is different, and also um, what kind of microbiome is present in this uh, uh, different portions of the colon are also different. So it, it's important to consider all these factors, but more, more important is the tumor more molecular profile, what kind of gene mutation it carries, what proteins are being expressed, and uh, what copies of genes are amplified. All, all those things are very important. Whether there is microsatellite instability or not is also another important factor in selecting treatment. Um, if, you, if you have all this information and uh, you know the patient's desire in terms of outcomes, so you do, you know, is it just um, length of life, quality of life, what, what, what is uh, to be achieved with the treatment, then you can personalize the treatment recommendations. So um, let's talk about uh, uh, ctDNA, how we can use it to personalize adjuvant treatment. Um, so the, the, this is, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the current practice model is everybody who is stage three colon cancer receives chemotherapy. But we know for sure half of those patients don't need chemotherapy. And uh, in stage two colon cancer, uh, we, we don't give routinely chemotherapy for all the patients. We select patients based on some clinical uh, high-risk features and we give chemotherapy, but we know for sure about 10, 15% of the patients will have cancer. So how uh, can we reliably identify those patients who need chemotherapy? This is a very important question because we're over-treating some patients, uh, obviously, in, at least in stage three, uh, those who don't need chemotherapy. So, what exactly is ctDNA? ctDNA is um, it's a cell-free DNA that is detected in the plasma of patients, and this uh, um, the you know it's released into the plasma from um, cell death or um, as a result of active secretion of the uh, fragment of DNA. So in in in, uh, in the case of um, um, tumors, the, this cell-free DNA is very unique compared to the cell-free DNA that we see from normal cells. Because, you know, apopto apto apoptosis and necrosis can happen to non-cancer cells as well. And there is always some, you know, cell-free DNA. It's like 
the, the West, you know, that, that gets uh, released into the blood constantly. So um, the ctDNA is unique in a way that it's a, it has shorter base fragment and the cleavage pattern is different from the, uh, the rest of the, the, the normal um, the cell free DNA come, coming from the normal cells. And also uh, it has a different methylation patterns and then it, it may carry some genetic mutations as well. So, uh, we, you know, over the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, many years, we have refined the tools to detect reliably the uh, cell free DNA that comes from the tumor uh, versus the, um, the normal cell. So uh, this, this is a picture I, I, I took from uh, the consensus paper from the NCI task force. I think it was uh, published a couple of years ago. It's a very important um, um, uh, picture. It helps you understand uh, the, 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 the role, the roles of ctDNA CT um, uh, detection kits uh, in the care of your, you know, your patients. So on one side, we have uh, um, on one side we have the, like the x-axis we have tumor burden. So uh, the ctDNA uh, detection threshold for extent of disease in the body is much lower than our typical radiographs in CAT scans and PET scans. Well, why does this matter? Because you now we are able to see cancer in the body when we cannot see it with our eyes. Um, you know, micros there's no microscopic disease or using, uh, you know, x-rays, CAT scans, and PET scans. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the mid part of the picture. I'm sorry, I think there is a reflection. Um, so if you look at the, um, the, the uh, where the, the, the graph drops right after surgery, so you do surgery, you remove a bulk of the tumor, so the amount of disease in the body drops significantly. So how far does that drop? We don't know. Would it be zero completely that the patient is cured or the amount of disease in the, in, in the body drops uh, to the level that we can no longer detect it? So it, would they have just micrometastatic disease or no disease at all? So these yellow um, nadir there in the middle can actually reach zero. Those are the patients who are cured by surgery, but that's not, that's not always the case. Some patients would have some disease left in the form of micrometastatic disease. So if you have a, an excellent test that can detect a, a very, very small uh, titer of um, uh, DNA coming from the tumors, then you can identify those patients and offer them treatments. So this is our the you know, minimal residual disease assessment. So, there are different assays being developed and have already been developed. Um, they're, they're, they differ in terms of how sensitive they are. Sensitive, not the biostatistical term. Uh, sensitive is like, uh, uh, what is the, the smallest fraction of DNA that they can detect? Uh, it's measured in uh, a variant allele frequency. The best test can detect uh, titers as low as 0.01%. What it means is, um, in uh, 10 ml of plasma, you, you're able to detect one variant allele frequency. Uh, the lower the number, the better it is. It's just like um, the test that you use to detect viral load in HIV. The lower the number, the better it is. Uh, there, are, you know, there are two broad uh, ways of uh, getting ctDNA. Um, I say one is a tumor-informed approach, and the other one is just tumor-naive approach. You don't need a tissue. Uh, in the in the tumor informed approach, you get a specimen. You look at the um, the genetic makeup of that tumor that was removed surgically, and then you develop a probe to see if those gene mutations appear in the blood. Um, the some critics of that would say um, you're looking for the tumor, you know markers of the tumor that's already been removed. What about new gene mutations? So how how is the test? going to be adaptable in the future if there is a clonal evolution. Uh, you know, certain micrometastatic cells start to express a different kind of genetic makeup. The tumor naive approach basically looks for, um, uh, you know, a couple of, um, uh, you know, different ways. One is uh, just a common hotspot alterations. 
So these are, you know, the, the gene mutations that we know for sure are, are, are uh, you know, commonly seen in uh, colorectal cancer. Or the other is um, looking at the tumor DNA from a different perspective, not mutation, but uh, the epigenetic signatures, uh, methylation markers, and all that. So using all these different uh, techniques, now we have different assays and um, they, they all have their own um, uh, data to back their um, respective uses. Um, uh, th th this is um, a slide to show how strong a prognostic marker CTDNA is. So we have relied for a long time on CA in our clinical uh, um, uh, high risk features, for example, a, a positive lymph node or lymphovascular invasion, bare invasion, as a markers of uh, how the patient is going to do in the future. Now, it, 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 the, these both studies are from uh, the Australian group. Um, the first one, the, the, the first bullet point in the first couple of graphs are from a stage two colon cancer uh, patients. I think they treated, uh, they looked at more than 230 patients. <laughs> And uh, the, it shows that uh, a positive CTDNA after surgery uh, is uh, correlated with a very high risk of cancer recurrence at about uh, two and a half years, so 27 months. So 80% recurrence. And uh, if you look at the hazard ratio there, it's 18%. So it's a very, very uh, strong correlation. There was no uh, correlation with CEA levels, the clinical uh, parameters that we use, the uh, high-risk features, they were correlated not as strongly. The hazard ratio is about 3%. That's the, the graph on the, on the on the right side at B. When you look at stage 3 colon cancer, uh, uh, post-op uh, positive CTDNA correlated um, uh, with a high risk of recurrence. So the recurrence-free survival after three years in uh, a positive uh, post of uh, CTDNA was uh, 47 percent versus uh, 76 for the negatives. So positive means bad, negative is good. Um, but as you can see, these numbers these are not absolute numbers. So there is either we need better assays to detect more because maybe the detection threshold is lower. We are missing some patients. Uh, because ideally, if you're able to pick all the patients with micromyostatic disease, the numbers should be 100 and zero. So uh, th there is uh, something missing there. So um, what is the unmet need here? So you have a patient with surgery, and uh, they either have stage three or stage uh, two colon cancer. Uh, they come for a you know, medical oncology consult. The question is, should I give them chemo or not? Um, we, the ideal test would be you do a test and then you detect a minimum residual disease and you say, okay, we need chemo. You do the test, it's negative. There's no minimum residual disease. You don't need chemo. So it makes it simple. Um, are we there yet? Can we use the CTDNA to make that kind of decision? Um, maybe, but not quite there yet. Maybe in the next five, six years, we may get there. Um, So if you, if you look at this uh, uh, slide from uh, the Australian group, uh, the, the, this is uh, in patients with stage two colon cancer. Uh, they used the CTDNA as a guidance uh, um, to treat patients with chemotherapy and, and compared it with patients who were you know, treated with chemotherapy using the existing standard of care approach. So the high risk features, the perforations of obstructions, the the uh, lymphovascular invasions, and all those high-risk features were used. So when you use CTDNA to guide your treatment uh, and not the clinical parameters, uh, there is a, a, a non-inferior outcome. Uh, the two-year two recurrence-free survival is comparable, but the rate of chemotherapy utilization is reduced by half. So uh, you can, you know, you can see on the right side there, the standard management, about 28% of patients received either four packs, K packs, or single agent uh, uh, fluoropyrimidines. Whereas on the, uh, oh, on the, on the CTD and the guided uh, management, you can see about only 15% of the patients received as a 50%, almost 50% reduction 
in utilization of chemotherapy. So um, let, let's say we have a patient and um, uh, they test positive for CTDNA after surgery. So does giving chemotherapy really help every patient? So this is a very important question because, yeah, you know, uh, we have adjuvant treatment that cures some patients and we're not sure if they're going to benefit or not. This, this is a very important question. Otherwise, there's no point in giving the chemotherapy in the first place. So this, these are a couple of slides from uh, the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, study, Galaxy studies, so they, they include a large number of patients and they have good numbers there. So if you look at the first slide there, the patients who tested positive for CTDNA after surgery and received chemotherapy, about 68% of those patients were able to clear their CTDNA. Uh, interestingly, about 10% of patients in their study were able to clear their CTDNA by themselves with no chemotherapy. Uh, what about the rest of the patients? The rest of patients did not clear the CTDNA. So why does this matter, whether you're able to clear the CTDNA or not? So if you look at the uh, second uh, slide on uh, the picture on, on, on the right here, it's um, the patients who never had a CTDNA following surgery and those who were able to clear it, they had the best survival outcomes. Basically, the, the disease-free survival rate is the best. The patients who either had a persistent CTDNA or the patients who had negative CTDNA and converted to positive uh, due to recurrence, they had the worst outcomes. So where does this lead us? So uh, can we use it in the clinic? Uh, not quite yet. So these are uh, prospective studies uh, currently undergoing in the US. Um, the, the, the first one uh, on your right side uh, is the COBRA study for stage two colon cancer. So this randomizes patients to standardized uh, approach versus a CT DAD guided um, treatment. These are patients we typically recommend uh, monitoring. So these are patients who don't have high risk features. They have T3 N0 disease. They don't have any high risk features. And at this time, you know, we offer them just watch and wait, let's see, monitor you, you do blood work and CAT scans if needed, colonoscopies and all that. So this study randomizes those patients to standardized approach versus uh, CT uh, DNA guided treatment. The ones who test positive, they would be offered treatment for six months. Uh, on the, uh, the, the flow chart on the left, that's for stage three. This is the circlet uh, study. And this ran basically randomizes patients based on the CTDNA positivity into uh, chemotherapy. Um, uh, so if they're positive, they get randomized between standard chemotherapy versus more intensified chemotherapy. And if they are negative, uh, mind you, these are patients who would receive chemotherapy in the current practice model because they have positive lymph nodes. So the, the patients with stage three uh, disease and CTDNA negative would be randomized into observation with serial monitoring versus chemotherapy, the standard approach. And this can, this can help a great deal. So let, let's, let's, let's shift gear into um, um, uh, advanced colorectal cancer. So this, um, this is just a, a slide to show you the frequency of uh, 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 molecular uh, aberrations in advanced colorectal cancer. The most common mutation is RAS mutation. Um, and then we have the BRAF uh, V600E and uh, the less frequently seen mutations or alterations include HER2 amplifications, um, change in MSI status and uh, a single gene alterations like uh, our cross and trans. Um, this has been, uh, you know, uh, talked about a lot. Uh, we know right side colon cancer is an aggressive cancer, but more recently we know that left side colon cancer responds better to anti-GFR therapy, not the right side. This is the, it's not that the right side is aggressive, um, but it also does not respond to anti-GFR therapy, even if there is RAS uh, wild-type uh, status. 
and this has been uh, shown recently in a, in a phase three study. It's a Japanese study, and uh, the degree of benefit is very small, but still it's a positive study. It's about a three months difference in the median overall survival. Um, for many years, we haven't been able to target the RAS mutation. And, but more recently, in the last few years now, we have some success. Um, we, 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 we have drugs that uh, are targeting the G12C mutation, which is not the most common uh, kind of RAS mutation, but it's a, it's a progress because the RAS uh, uh, protein has been elusive for many years. The BRAF gene mutation can also be targeted, which you know, is seen in about 10% of patients. So uh, this is the adagrasib is the selective KRAS G12C inhibitor. This has been um, uh, shown to uh, help control disease and uh, shrink tumors as well and improve survival, especially in combination with an anti-GFR antibody, cetuximab. And the man it has a very manageable uh, toxicity profile. And there is an ongoing study uh, in a phase three study in the second line to see if this is truly uh, the, the treatment option for these patients. Uh, the uh, BRAF inhibitor, uh, encorafenib, previously had been shown to uh, help control colorectal cancer, especially in combination with taximab. There was a study uh, to look at the addition of um, a MEK inhibitor, benimetinib, if, if it would improve uh, outcomes or not, but unfortunately not. The outcomes are exactly the same. So there's no need to add the MEK inhibitor. So in corafenib and cetuximab, the, the, those two are the, the way to go, uh, at least in, in, this, in this area. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, some information from the safety leading portion of the breakwater study. This is, uh, uh, you know, patients with no previous therapy. Uh, the, the bigger study is for, uh, you know, for frontline use of uh, uh, a BRF inhibitor uh, with cetuximab plus chemotherapy, but the safety leading has a both first line and second line. If you look at the numbers, they are small. The, the sample sizes are small, but the outcomes are actually uh, very good. HER2 amplifications. So um, HER2 amplifications have been targeted um, in, in colorectal cancer using different drugs, but the most significant one would be the Montagnier uh, study where uh, patients with uh, HER2 amplification were treated with tocatinib and trastuzumab. These are patients previously treated. It started out as a small study, but it eventually it expanded with cohorts. And uh, the outcome was, uh, was, was really good. Um, these are patients who would respond to anti-AGFR therapy and all that. Now, so the confirmed overall response rate in these patients was about you know, 38%. If you look, compare this with the other anti-HER2 um, um, uh, regimens that were tried before, it, it's very within the ballpark, slightly higher. Um, about a third of patients with HER2 amplification um, uh, they respond to anti-HER2 therapy. Uh, both uh, the trastuzumab, pertuzumab studies, trastuzumab, apatinib studies, and uh, trastuzumab, it's a tongue twister, in HER2, uh, they, they have uh, uh, comparable uh, response rates. Now, um, this would be my, my last slide, but in summary, you know, uh, personalizing treatment is very important in the adjuvant setting. We need to select patients who can benefit from chemotherapy better. We have newer tools, and we'll see what the ongoing studies show us. All patients with advanced can colorectal cancer, they need molecular profiling in addition to understanding their uh, physical needs, health needs, to be able to personalize their treatment better. Thank you. Thank you, Tesfair. Uh, for a nice uh, review on the updates on ctDNA in colorectal cancer and target therapy. And we have, uh, we can take a, a few questions. Um, so I will start. Um, so you can see it's quite exciting to um, see a lot of um, uh, data, promising data on uh, patients on 
uh, patients with selected mutations in biliary tract cancer, in pancreas cancer, in colorectal cancer. So there's always a challenging, like when patient is diagnosed with metastatic advanced stage disease, how long we need to wait for the profile, for the results from NGS um, to, to, to start on therapy. And we've, uh, for biliary tract cancer, uh, sometimes we have, um, like we, we, it's difficult to enroll patients on those frontline study that needs the NGS results. And so um, I have a question for, doc, uh, for the audience and also speakers and also Dr. Um, uh, Makarula is um, in terms of the, 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 the turnaround time of NGS and the coverage of NGS at a different stage of cancer diagnosis, how it is covered and what is the turnaround time in Europe and in the US. Yeah, if you want, I can start if you want. So uh, th that's a huge problem, especially in those patients that need the results in order to be included in clinical trials. I think as a general concept, we have to do the NGS as soon as possible in the, in the advanced disease, no? in order to have the results during the first line treatment. And in this case, it's not so urgent to have the results, but it is true that when you have to wait the results in order to include the patient in the clinical trial, uh, normally, in my in my case, to wait more than two three weeks, it's very complicated. In Europe, um, we have two different ways. Normally, we have the problem that it's not reimbursed for the majority of of countries, the the the, the governments. So um, we have to do it through the screening of different clinical trials and, for example, a complete NGS analysis in home. The in home tested maybe it can we have to wait two two weeks two weeks or three but if we send a sample to foundation or caries we have maybe to wait between three and four weeks so that's not possible if you have to wait the the, the, the results in order to start the treatment no so it's a i think it's a complicated issue and probably when we Im will improve in the future i hope the liquid biopsies no to have more sensitivity to detect for example a, a fusions um maybe we can save uh, some time there because with the tissue sometimes you send the tissue there's not enough tissue there's necrosis blah 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 so that's something that adds more time uh dr maron uh what is your comments on um waiting for the ngs results before you start the patients on treatment yeah i completely agree it's problematic what i actually do in the stage four setting is i can send people for msk impact which even with an in-house sample, it takes about four weeks to turn around. But at the same time, I do um, CTDNA testing. One, because of the probability of at least one of these tests failing. Uh, but two, because we found that if you test both a uh, CTDNA and primary or primary MET, both for tissue, um, going up to two tests increase your sensitivity significantly for finding an actionable alteration. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, I have one more question before Do Dr. Marshall has a question. So um, I think this question is for both uh, Dr. Magrula and Dr. Maron. So uh, Dr. Magrula has talked about the data on um, ASCOT um, uh, classification of the importance of act actionable mutations. And in your presentation, you have shown um, the ASCOT level one to two and the PFS is, is longer compared to ESCOR three to four. And I, I realize you uh, performed this study um, as, a, as part of clinic trials. So how would this um, provide guidance in a community oncologist and how, uh, is there any ways to get treatment uh, for the ESCOR uh, level one or two if it's not uh, approved uh, yet by FDA or uh, in, in Europe? Um, and so uh, the question is also for Dr. Maron, because I also know you, you did the consortium study and tried to do uh, select patients for uh, non-approved therapy, but approved for other indication. And um, I think it's uh, for treating physicians in the community, when you see those uh, promising data and how, how well can you get the, the, the drug um, off, uh, they're, not even, they're not approved or not part of the trial. Yeah, in my case, I think SCAT classification in cholangiocarcinoma and our analysis help us 
to choose why we have to fight for a drug for a patient. Of course, if you have a drug that is approved, blah, blah, it's easy. But sometimes, for example, in Europe, you know, it's more complicated. I have a HER2 amplify uh, patient. Uh, so, or, or I have a BRAF, this is 100E. So I know that I have to fight in order to have the, the, the treatment because I know that this patient can't respond, no? because it's, it's an SCAD1 or 2 uh, class alteration. Uh, so for me, it's it's something like this, no? that help us to understand why we have to fight more. And if I, if I have an alteration that it can respond, but we don't know, for example, I don't know, um, Met amplification in Colangio. I don't have data, so uh, maybe I don't have to fight so much. No, for me, it's help. Like it helps for this to 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 know that uh, the, the patient can benefit from the treatment and have an impact in overall survival. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, um, clinical trials are always the way to go when you don't have an approval. But we have to be realistic that a lot of our patients either are excluded for one reason or another, like measurable disease, or they live just too far away from a center doing it. And so um, we're fortunate to have a compassionate use mechanism for, for instance, Medicare patients who can't really go off the reservation. And sometimes we can also um, talk to uh, private insurers as well and get some of these drugs just approved. Um, and the reality of it is, the better the rationale for doing it that we have in publications, like what we put out, the easier it is to get drugs for our patients who need them. And I've already had people reaching out because of CGFR paper saying, thanks to this paper, they were able to get access and help their patients. So it, it's really satisfying for, for the work that we do to really help patients with these agents, even if they're not approved because they're so uncommon. So there are a question from Dr. Marshall. Well, I hope can you all yeah. hear us. Uh, we think the room is high tech enough that you can hear us uh, without a microphone. Okay, good. Um, so I, I'd like to challenge you to, as leaders, uh, global leaders in drug development, for what's next, because the a lot of the studies that we talked about today already are isolating a drug in a very specific setting to demonstrate, in some ways, proof of principle responses in the 30-40% range, we're very pleased by 80% responses, but we're seeing increasingly combinations of therapies, which, whether that's chemo or other targeted agents, drive it further. I think about the complex signaling pathways in colorectal cancer and other GI cancers. So one drug, one target is not satisfying, but it's not where we want to end up. So can you talk a little bit about how we as academic institutions can improve the process or increase the rate of doing these kinds of combination tests when uh, it might involve more than one company or a novel sort of biologic idea. How, where do we go from here? Al DeBron, you're the world's expert. What, what would you say? <laughs> I cannot hear very well the question. So it's how we have how we have to move forward with these new combinations yeah. or something yeah. like this. He's yeah. saying, where's the great leap forward? So I, I think, first of all, to understand the biology of the tumor. So to have data, uh, to understand the preclinical data, to try to characterize these tumors. An example is a cholangiocarcinoma. So for example, we did a, a, a huge effort to understand how the IDH1 mutated tumors are different from other tumors because maybe there's less immune infiltration. So first of all, to understand that not the tumor is the same, and then this gives the rationale for the new strategy. So not combining immunotherapy with all the drugs. So it's may, maybe we need some this preclinical work in order to understand uh, which are the, the combinations with more rationale. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, try this probably, for example, in pancreatic, uh, that it's very difficult to have a uh, succeed in these new combinations. Try these small trials with different treatment strategies. If it's working, go, move forward, if not, close the, the arms, so something like this, uh, not to, to put a lot of uh, patients in new strategies, in new combination with no biological rationale. So so maybe uh, something like this, but, but it's, a, it's a complex question, but something like this. 
I think I think it's been a huge year for us in terms of new types of therapies. We're, we're looking at degraders now. We're looking at small molecules in conjunction with then targeting the antigens that are, that are sort of the, the processed proteins that are being targeted on the cell surface then with immunotherapies. And just the new types of therapies that have been published in the past six to 12 months, I, I think are showing what we can do when we understand the biology like Dr. Macarillo was just talking about. And in doing so with these kinds of combinations, we're not really playing whack-a-mole anymore with that downstream RAS amplification or mutation. And we've actually seen that RAS and TP53 have suddenly become targetable in the past few months. So I want to congratulate, I want to congratulate you on very interesting work. One of the questions I have is about the assay. And so you have a very clear signal, it's easier to understand it, but how often are you finding either a discordance between the tumor and the cell-free DNA, or the cell-free DNA gives you a very unclear signal. You don't know what to do with it. So how often do you see that? Very often. Um, so there are a few different issues here. Um, the first issue is the detection in ctDNA is going to be proportional to the tumor volume. So on one hand, if you have somebody with very low tumor volume, the absence of an alteration just says that you, you just might not have enough there. So it, it, the negative predictive value isn't very good. Conversely, if you have somebody with an incredible amount of tumor burden, then you're more likely to find these subclonal alterations. And when you're looking at a difference, when they're reporting a copy number in some of these reports of 2.2 to 2.4, uh, to put that in context, without correcting for the, the max VAF, the tumor burden, in a sense, um, I, I just don't find it to be a very useful uh, number. And so they actually came up with, Garden came up with this uh, algorithm that they used in Heracles that helps do that correction. And I find it works quite well, actually. Um, so that's the first caveat. The next piece is, um, it's definitely clear that if you have somebody who has ctDNA detection with a low max VAF, they're going to do incredibly well. Um, if you have somebody who's HER2 positive in the tumor and has some detectable ctDNA but doesn't have the HER2 amplification, it generally suggests that they just have a lower level of expression because when you have amplification, you have logarithmically higher protein expression when you look by mass spec. And so rather than this, this ordinal scale we look at, uh, it, it's really a continuous scale that we just don't account for very well with our current testing. So I think it is meaningful when you see these high level amplifications without concurrent um, resistance mechanisms at baseline. Very nice session. Uh, thanks for, to our three uh, insightful speakers who provide a very um, uh, nice update and also very nice questions and discussion. And now uh, let's have a 10 minutes break and, and then we're gonna have a, a followed by a very exciting uh, session on immunotherapy and cellular therapy. Thank you.